Boy. So first of all, thanks everyone for being here. I'm super excited for running this for the first time. Um, before we get started, I want to introduce Brianna, who's, uh, who's running Founder Lab uh, with me and, and helping out a ton. So Brianna uh, is an early stage founder of a product company, um, and she's also a Turtle customer. Um, so I figured it would have been useful, well, one, for, for me to get some help running this, but also to have someone that may have not spent the last decade in and out of product and in every nook and cranny of product details that you guys could have to chat with, to talk to, um, and just to, to help guide along uh, from a perspective of someone who's relatively newish to this. Yeah, that sums it up. Cool. And hey there, I think we just had uh, Einer join. All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start screen sharing. Let me know once everyone can see my screen. Looks good. Cool. Yeah. All right. So welcome to week one. Um, so I wanted to give a little background about who I am, why, uh, why I'm talking about product, why I'm obsessed with this stuff, et cetera. So I originally went to undergrad actually because I wanted to design cars and mechanical engineering felt like the right way to do that. Um, quickly fell out of that and by the end of undergrad, I ended up graduating with an engineering and business degree and catching the startup bug and, and joining a startup to work, uh, to work at. I uh, ended up going to grad school at Cornell Tech, which is a very product-focused MBA program, a tech and product-focused MBA program. Um, but I think where I've worked probably highlights the product obsession a, a little more than that. Um, so I started my career as a developer at Merkle uh, in undergrad. I very quickly, uh, when graduating from undergrad, gravitated towards product and focused on a uh, early stage startup in the DC area. I then worked at Audi for a bit where I actually started in a sales op role, ops role, but actually also ended up designing a product for them. That was interesting. I just stumbled into designing an, a, a web app that another team was building. Um, I then left Audi kind of knowing that I'm a terrible employee and just don't like the traditional office job. And that really was the main culprit in my decision making um, and started Darwin Apps, uh, where we ended up building products for companies, including Audi, uh, Seagate, Meltwater, namely AT&T, Thomson Reuters, and many others. Um, I left Darwin in early 2016 to start Turtle, where I think we can reach a much wider audience of, of helping people build product uh, by accessing talent all over the world. Um, so this is not going to be about Turtle, uh, and I don't want the focus to be here. So, But just to give you a, a, a set of why I'm even doing this, um, I'm wearing sweatpants right now. I believe in remote work. I, uh, I don't think that everybody should be stuck in an office or a nine to five. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we create systems for non-traditional work that don't exist today. So you can think of Turtle as an operating system for non-traditional time remote work. Um, if anybody's curious about it, just ping me on it in the group chat that we've set up. Um, I don't want this to be too Turtle focused. I want this to be product focused. But if anybody do does have questions, just ping me directly about this. So the core content of this is going to, of, of the entire sessions, is going to be balancing this intersection of code, pixels, and money, which, in my opinion, is the intersection of product. Um, I have an engineering and a business degree and an MBA degree. I spend most of my time in design, and I spend most of my time working with developers outside of my actual time designing. So I sort of balance my time directly between these three, and I think they're the three pillars of, of product. Um, and just knowing not only how they interact together, but the different players between them, and, and most importantly, your own skill sets, interests, and where you can fit into these. Um, there's a lot of room to contribute to product, and most people think that it just has to be done by developers and outsiders, et cetera. That's totally wrong. Uh, it should be product founders, product leaders that are getting ahead of these decisions, understanding the finances behind uh, product development, understanding the different players that are involved, um, and understanding where they can fit in and contribute most. Um, so enough about me, a little about you guys. Uh, we've got 10 participants in the, in the first batch. So there are 10 founders. Uh, you're across five different time zones in three different countries. Uh, there's actually two lawyers. I was surprised by that. Uh, we've got a bunch of great schools that you went to, great companies that you've worked at. So I pulled out a few interesting logos. 
Um, and you're 50-50 split between men and women. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I, uh, I do want to do a quick, or give everyone a quick chance to do a quick intro, but please just say your name and where you're from. Um, and then we're going to get into deeper product intros inside of the group chat that we've, we've set up on Open Land, which we'll talk about. Um, so I'm going to just pull up the participants list. And we can go one by one. Um, so Einar, would you mind starting? Uh, yeah, no problem. Hey guys, uh, my name is uh, Einar Nureev. I'm from Russia, Moscow. Uh, uh, and I guess I'm one of those two lawyers. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Unless I missed a third lawyer. <laughs> Uh, Alexandra, would you mind going next? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Alexandra. I'm from Russia as well. Uh, so I'm the CEO of uh, BloggerPass platform. It's uh, the app for bloggers and uh, business services. Thanks. Um, Ingrid, would you mind going next? Sure. I'm Ingrid Mira. I'm, I guess I'm from New York now. I've been here for almost some years on and off. Um, and I am an ex-orthodontist, and I'm starting a hybrid company of direct-to-consumer and in-person model for highest quality, most convenient care. Cool. Welcome. Um, Brianna, would you mind doing a quick intro? I've just got you on the list, too. But to be clear, Brianna's not one of the participants. Brianna's helping me run Founder Lab. Yeah. I'm Brianna. I'm originally from Sacramento, California, but now I live in New York. Um, who do we have next? Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, um, I'm originally from Houston, Texas, and then I lived in uh, Taiwan in Asia, and then now I'm based in New York. Cool. Um, Heike? Uh, so yeah, I am natively Estonian. I lived in uh, a, lot of, a lot of different places, but currently living in Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, yeah, sort of between two ventures and now working on working on a new at the moment side project and trying to sort of get deeper into how to how to help people be better friends yeah cool we could all use a little help there uh, <laughs> nick hi i'm nick i'm originally from uh, the middle of nowhere in connecticut and now i'm in the middle of nowhere in maine <laughs> welcome i think i got your stickers Nice. Just wanted um, to see that <laughs> the Erie of Police stickers. As did I? Uh, did I miss anyone? Zoom was kind of moving people around as different people started talking, but uh, I want to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Okay, I think I got all eight. Cool. All cool. right. Um, so yeah, we we didn't talk much about the companies that you're building, but you are all building incredibly interesting companies. Everything from um, a lighter therapy to helping people translate content into audio, um, any kind of content into audio to better connecting friends and, and uh, providing more, more meaningful relationships between people um, and even somebody working with comedians. So uh, you guys will get into the details of each other's companies inside of the group chat that we're building. Um, but uh, I'm incredibly excited at all the products that you will build, are building, um, and I hope that the content out of this will, uh, will keep you or make you more confident in, uh, in the product leaders that you will become. Um, we also have a lot of exciting speakers uh, coming up in the following weeks. So next week, we're going to have a designer from Google and, Link and LinkedIn. Um, we have a pending designer from, uh, from another New York based unicorn as well. So we might end up having two speakers. Um, later in the weeks, we have speakers that have been founders at Y Combinator and 500 startups. Um, we have the two founders of Datalog that'll come uh, at a uh, um, either week three or four. Uh, I wanted them to join because they have like a totally different perspective on hiring than I do. Um, I totally believe in part-timers and, and in the future of teams being X percent full-time and Y percent part-time and really building systems around that part-time nature. And there are startups that don't believe in part-timers and remote work. Um, Datalog is one of them. They mostly hire full-timers. And I wanted you to hear that perspective from a company that's raised a bunch of money, hired a bunch of people, and, and operates in that traditional Silicon Valley way. Um, and then really exciting, we're gonna have the CEO of GitLab, which is valued at over a billion dollars uh, at this point. They've raised, I think, like uh, over 100 mil and are valued over a billion and, and uh, may go public in the next couple of years. So their CEO will be speaking with us towards the, uh, the very end of the program. Um, all right, back to uh, where we started here, this magic triangle of dollars, code, pixels. 
Um, you're all here because a product is core to your business in some way, shape, or form. Most of this content will be heavily skewed towards the early stage of product development. Um, I think the principles you can apply towards later stage companies and uh, in larger products, but most of this content, the way to think about pricing, the way to think about team structure will be heavily skewed towards the early days of the company. So uh, if you're building Instagram or aligner therapy or, or anything in between, uh, there I'm assuming that there is some product component to what you're building and that's why this is interesting to you and, and you express that in your applications. This is the graphic that I, I tend to use to kind of explain the x-ray of a product and what goes behind it. So no matter what's being built in, in today's world, whether it's an iPhone app or an Android app or a web application or a combination of those systems, uh, here are the essential five stages that you can think of for what a product is. Uh, typically it starts with an idea and there's not really a high threshold to being able to come up with an idea to whiteboard something to get a concept together. Uh, and then that moves to a design. So literally a pixel perfect design of what a product should look like. And there is some threshold to that. Some people are self-taught designers, some people hire professional designers, some people uh, kind of blend the two and, and work hand in hand with their designers to create products. Um, but essentially making something that looks exactly like the product that you will build is that design phase. Um, then there's a front end phase, which is code, but it's only, some people say half, uh, there's a deeper way to look at it as, as a third of, of the code that, that really will go into things, but it's just the code that you're interacting with. So it's quite literally taking a design and making it into, into code. So going from pixels to code, but not interacting with data, storage, backend systems, or all these other terms that you may have heard of, like backend versus front-end development. Um, then behind an actual app, there is always a backend. Uh, so backend development is very different than front-end development in that you're not really interacting with pixels, you're more interacting with data and how that data changes over time in your product. So for example, um, if I hit this confirm button in this totally made up volunteering app, uh, recognizing that this is gonna intersect with this specific Sunday time slot and register me for that specific time slot, actually clicking that button is front-end development and then actually storing the data behind that click is back-end development. And then behind that back-end development layer is where your actual data is sitting. So a table that will say here are your users, here are your different time slots, et cetera, and here's who's registered for different time slots. So this is a super, super high level view, but I do think it's important to, as you look at products, as you, as you think about your own products, as you think about your own skill sets, figure out at what stages are different products at, at what stages is your team strongest, is, at what stages may you need help from others, um, and really kind of soak in this graphic to, uh, to understand the different stages that your product will go through. Um, any questions so far? Take that as a no, and we'll keep leave uh, plenty of time at the end to make sure that we go back and forth on this stuff and dive into the details here. So um, I'm planning to leave about 20 minutes at the end for questions. All right, so uh, today we're gonna jump into just the, the general principles of, of product development and some concepts that I'd love for you to walk away with for your own products. We're not gonna get deep into the different tools of design code, et cetera, um, but I do want you to walk away from this uh, with the ability to conceptualize what part of product is, is most complicated, what isn't, um, and where you and your team might fit in most and where you might need to strengthen your team. Uh, so one of the uh, most common things that, that I usually tell people building their first product is to understand this idea of 10x cost of software development. Uh, the principle is simple, and it's not an exact rule or exact science, but it's a pretty good estimate. What it basically says is, if you're building a product and you're gonna spend an hour designing it, to work with a professional designer to be able to go from wireframe to this is what the product will look like in actual code and reality, every one hour that it takes you will probably take a professional designer about 10 hours. Uh, that's not because they're slow or because they're sitting behind a screen kind of getting every pixel right. It's typically because of the iteration. Uh, so sitting and sketching something on a whiteboard is important and it might be quick, but getting that into a design that not only the designer, but the rest of the team approves and likes is very likely to take 10x that time. Now where the costs really start rising dramatically is actual code. So taking one little screen, kind of going back to, to here, uh, it might have taken me one hour or less to sit there and get this concept of this wireframe together. Um, to get this through different iterations of 
hey, this is totally development ready here, all the different iterations of this possible screen, easily 10 hours. Uh, and then to pick out different frameworks that are being used, set up a base code repo, code repository, um, and even get a very basic design together like this could easily, from zero to actually having a clickable product in your hand, could easily turn into 100 hours. That might sound like a crazy exaggeration, but we see this happen all the time. Um, so what this should, this should uh, mean to you is not don't build everything or, or don't design anything, but really think about what is it that you're building and understand that uh, if something is gonna take you one hour to wireframe or go deeper into concepts or two hours to wireframe and go into concepts, it's probably gonna dramatically increase the costs of design and development down the line. And really this just brings back to a, a, a engineering principle of keep it as simple as possible. At the early stages, you do wanna be as scrappy as possible and you do wanna keep it as simple as possible so that your costs don't run out of control before you actually know if you're building the right thing or not. Um, so this is not, again, a exact formula. It's a general rule. We'll dive into kind of how this breaks down in later sessions, specifically the budgeting session. Um, but I, I, I wanna make sure that uh, people don't walk away from this thinking that you know code is easy if you haven't coded before. I guess that's uh, <laughs> one of the main takeaways here. Um, the other big concept that we're gonna go through today is this concept of skateboarding. So combining the idea of product design is gonna take much longer than product ideation, and then product development is gonna take much longer than the product design, uh, you should be thinking about your own products in, in a form of, okay, well, if everything's gonna cost me 10X the time that I'm putting and then code is gonna cost me 10X that, then how do I really isolate my idea down to the core nugget that actually matters? Um, and we'll go into this uh, pretty lengthy in this session. So skateboarding is um, this concept of how do I remove everything that doesn't matter and really figure out that one thing that does matter. Um, now one of these paths is much easier to take than the other. Uh, for example, uh, figuring out what the most important element of Facebook is. It probably took them years and years to figure this out but they were probably very easily able to figure out the parts that didn't matter, the parts they weren't focused on, or in the early stages, the parts of MySpace that just didn't matter to them. So there's two paths to get to what is that one thing that matters most for my product, and it's essential to get here at the early stages. Um, that first path is you nurture what is, that, what is it that's gonna matter most, what is it that's the core essence of your product, uh, and this is incredibly hard to do. I, I don't think that I can give you a clear answer for Turtle right now and we're three years in. Um, I don't think that I could go to anyone on my team and get that answer right now because it's very natural to, as you're building a company, it is complex. Uh, a product is complex and everything does matter. Uh, and there would probably be a list of a few things that I would list right now that matter the most that, uh, that I, I could not get down to that one nugget. What I can do very easily though is cut away the parts that don't matter. Um, the easy cheat code for this is login screens. So whenever anybody is designing a product for the very first time, especially wireframing a product for the first time, they typically start with a login screen. Uh, and that makes sense because maybe all the wireframes you've looked at or UI frameworks you've looked at or prior apps you've looked at all have a login screen, but the login screen does not matter. It's been built 10,000 times before by other teams. It's been figured out before. There's nothing creative about it. There's nothing unique about it and it's still gonna take you that 10X time to design and 10X time to build once you get through authentication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a really easy one to cut out because it's just something that others have done before and it's not gonna be that magic nugget uh, that your company should be focused on. So uh, again, here are those two paths just to kind of put them in text and not in pictures, uh, but going from zero to one, which is if you do have that insight, if you, if you do know that magic nugget that your product is gonna be most, most focused on, uh, that is a way that some founders start. I think it's incredibly difficult to do because often those guesses are wrong. The much easier thing to do is to get rid of the unimportant before later or the things that have been done 100 times over and use that as a process of elimination to get to what, it, what is it that your skateboard is. Um, the other concept of this that is important is if you're combining this concept of 10X software dev and how expensive things get, uh, the other thing that skateboarding does is it gets you to the next horizon. So it significantly enhances your decision-making with how you should build a second version of your product or add a second feature. Or maybe if you did skip that login screen to realize that 
you can just log in with Google or you can just log in with Facebook or you can just do email and the rest doesn't matter for now because that's not most important to your product. Getting to step two gives you much clearer insights to step three because step three is usually behind a horizon that you don't have access to right now. Um, there's this fallacy that, that I think a lot of us are often hit with where we try to plan everything up front. If we had a, a million dollar budget, how would we spend it? Or if we had a hundred thousand dollar budget, how would we spend it? And I included that as part of the question uh, in, in your application. Uh, I typically urge people to think about it as, okay, well, if I have a hundred thousand dollars, how do I spend the first thousand? Or how do I spend the first 5,000? Because that will inform you how to spend the next 99,000 or the next 95,000 remaining. You will have gotten to that next horizon for product decision making. Um, one example is, is Uber. So Uber is an incredibly complicated company that's doing a lot of things today. But if we had to think about a skateboard, uh, anybody have ideas for, for what Uber does? If, if somebody had to pick the most important thing that, that Uber's focused on, what is it? Connect drivers with taxi cabs. Yeah, that's essentially it. And if you were, if you were a, a user, the most important thing is you press a button, you get a car. That's it. Of course, the payment systems matter. Of course, the uh, verification systems matter. Everything else matters in between. But when Uber was first building Uber and focused on, on how to get a product out to market, the only thing that mattered was you could pull out a phone, you could press a button, and you can get a car. That's it. Everything else was secondary. That is their skateboard. Uh, I think that sounds really simple now because we're looking at their product and we're seeing where it's gone, et cetera. But before that existed, I think that was actually incredibly difficult to see. Uh, going back to the PC era, I. I remember watching uh, one of the Steve Jobs movies and he had trouble selling computers because people couldn't see that you needed a, a keyboard and a screen and a CPU in one. People were like, that's crazy to put them together. But his nugget of wisdom was you put these together and you put them in a home and that's what matters. Um, it, it's not that different from Uber's approach of you press a button and you get a ride. How about Instagram? So for Instagram, you press a button and your photo is up to others. Your photo is available for others, that's it. Um, it's, it's a really, really, it's an instant way to get your picture out there. Yes, they do a lot of things, they have stories, they have comments, they have everything else, but until you could press a button and get a picture out there, nothing else mattered. So I, uh, I hope that, that those couple examples may help you think about what is it in your products that is that nugget of wisdom, what is it that you can cut away uh, that you can really start focusing on and building around. Uh, Twitter's another example where it's press a button, share 140 characters with others. The threading, all that kind of stuff, they still don't have an edit button, et cetera. Um, I'm still a, a massive fan of Twitter and the community there. Um, but they, they did start with this simple nugget of wisdom. And if you look at the companies that, that have grown fastest and, and have really made the biggest impacts in the last 10, 15 years of, of our lives, they do tend to have one nugget of, of really simple wisdom that they've gotten incredibly good at, that they focused on, that they've gotten better than everyone else. And of course, the, the thousand other pieces and the thousand other people that help get them there absolutely matter, but it typically starts with this one nugget that they've been able to all rally around and focus on. Um, so going back to, to the cost structure of, of that little triangle that we shared, uh, between Darwin Apps and, and Turtle, I get this question a lot how much will this app cost me? Uh, you may have thought this about your own products as well. Uh, if you are a founder that's building a company where the technology will be critical, uh, I mean no offense by this, but this is a terrible question. This would be like asking someone else to figure out your problems for you. It's asking for someone to uh, give you an estimate of something that doesn't exist yet. So estimates exist for, uh, Plumbing, for example, because it's an incredibly standardized process. It's the same thing over and over again. But when you're building somewhat something new, yes, someone can estimate if everything around them was fixed, how much time they think would go to something. But one, that's probably going to be wrong. Then the other element that they aren't thinking about is they have no idea about you, your skill sets, your experience, what you bring to the table. Um, if a team that had a designer and a backend engineer and could architect an app requested something, and requested a cost, that's a completely different cost than if somebody who's new to product development requests something. So 
I wouldn't look at things this way uh, because it's really, it, you should look at it instead as, as how can you control the costs of an app? How can you better understand the different players that would be involved in, in product development um, and the different time that will go in, their different costs, how to estimate that cost, how to measure that cost and, and get away from this, how much will an app cost me and throw the work over the, work over the wall mentality if the product is critical to your business. There are businesses where outsourcing the product and asking someone how much will it cost because it's been done before, it's not really dissimilar from another product, actually does work, but it's rare when it's core to your business. If it's core to your business, uh, I really encourage you to get ahead of understanding the costs and being in control of those costs and asking an outsider uh, for those. So uh, it still doesn't answer how do you budget, how do you spend, how do you get ahead of these costs? Because of course, if you don't know what costs, you can't plan your business. Uh, one thing that people shy away from often are constraints. I think that they're great because constraints are uncreative ways to be able to limit how you think about scope and product development. Uh, for example, if you were to take everything I told you today and said, okay, well, what should my team build? It's a pretty open-ended question. But what if you asked yourself that with what should my team build this month? Or what should my team build this month with a $5,000 budget? All of a sudden, if we start combining this with the skateboarding mentality and getting to the nugget of what matters most, we offer these artificial constraints that at least get us thinking about, okay, well, what's possible in a month? What's possible in this kind of budget? And then backtracing what a budget means with whether you've hired full-timers or you're compensating someone on an hourly basis or a monthly basis or some combination of dollar and equity. There's a lot of different ways to do this, but it all of a sudden gets much easier to, to frame how is it that we should approach building something. Um, so to summarize that, uh, I would urge you to fix time, fix budget, and flex scope. Uh, the flex scope part is critical here because as a startup, just everything changes. In a month, you might see a different nugget of wisdom than you saw a month before as what your skateboard is or isn't. Uh, but time never changes and time never stops for anyone. And you could easily constrain something to a quarter or a month. And, and budget is a pretty static figure that while a lot of people would rather ask how much will this cost me? But I would rather founders think about, well, here's my budget and how do I be in control of my own destiny and stay in control of that? You, this doesn't mean that you can't have conversations with engineers or designers about estimates or how long they think something will take, uh, but those questions should not be for you to like, hang them by a noose to a fixed cost. Uh, it should be for you to better understand how to budget your projects. Um, the worst case scenario that you could get into, or one of the worst case scenarios that you can get into is, and I apologize if anybody here has dealt with this before because I know it's a, it's a very nasty experience. If you ask for a fixed price on a project and that fixed price just doesn't happen and it's towards the end of a project and what it, it becomes this conflict of, well, the founder wants to get as much possible out of their budget because they've already paid it and it's a fixed budget and then the person doing the work once out of it because now their time is, isn't getting compensated for or anything. And that's just not the way that great quality work gets produced. If we think about the teams that uh, get us excited about startups and, and product, they're usually teams where everybody was in the same boat and everybody had the same mentality of, of let's build the most important things in the least amount of time with the least amount of budget uh, and get this company to the next stage. It's very rarely somebody was forced to finish something within a fixed budget because of a specific detail in contract. Very large companies may operate that way when they uh, sell off parts of their business that don't matter and, and parts of their product that don't matter. But for an early stage startup, uh, I, would, I would much rather use budget as an advantage to constrain your own planning uh, and not something to, to create a conflict between you and people that are working on your core product. Uh, the other piece of this is just you shouldn't expect fixed prices from fixed plans. As a startup, things are turbulent, things will change. What you plan in month one is different than month two. And instead of hoping for, for someone to agree to a fixed price or estimate on something, uh, I would just be honest with the nature of startups and, and how turbulent things are. Uh, and the, the, quick, the, or the most succinct way that I've been able to explain this is just, you can get fixed prices from fixed plans. When things are repetitive, when things are, are exactly as they've been done before, it becomes more possible to, to get a fixed cost estimate and for you know, industries that have been around for hundreds of years, but, or tens of years at least, but 
software dev is changing constantly. There are different ways and, and tools to build things. And you're also just building something that doesn't exist before if you're working on a startup. So getting a fixed cost for that is incredibly difficult. Um, and, and, you know, I want to make sure that, that in the sessions that, um, that we hold in the future and in, in the discussions that we have on group chat, you're able to apply this exactly to your product. So if, if you're having trouble working through what is your skateboard, um, please ping me, please ping me directly just through open land and, and we'll go through how to set that up in a second here. Uh, but I, I think it's incredibly important for you to get the most out of the following sessions for you to come to session two with, well, what is your skateboard? We all started this with what our products were, what our companies were. Uh, but at this point, you might be kind of thinking, well, here's a rough idea of a skateboard. I think you should have a very clear idea of what that skateboard is before week two. Uh, it'll make sure that you're getting a lot more out of the following sessions. I also want you to think about you know, between that triangle of code, uh, pixels, and money, where are your interests most? All of those are critical. People are like, I need a software developer to, to build my, my company. And of course, you need a software developer, but a software developer that can't manage the cost behind software development will run out of money. And the majority of startups fail because they don't have money, not because they have bad software developers. Uh, same thing on the design side. If you feel like your interests are, are, or skill sets are stronger on the design side, I would go deeper there. It's an incredibly important part of software dev that often gets overlooked. People say, I need a developer. Well, if we go back to that 10x rule of software dev, there's a very good chance the developer builds the wrong thing if you can't apply it. Some of the biggest impacts I've seen, and, and so the speaker that we're gonna have next week from Google and LinkedIn, uh, he was actually at Darwin Apps, and I think we worked with incredible engineers throughout the career of Darwin Apps, but I'm not sure that another individual made a bigger impact on the company than, than Alex. Uh, he totally changed the, the perception of the company, the brand of the company, uh, the level of fidelity that, that the products looked like, uh, got us to a totally different tier of, of consulting business at the time. Uh, and I don't think I can say the same about a specific engineer as I can about a specific designer. So all three parts of that triangle matter. Uh, eventually, as you get deep, if you do become a product obsessed founder, um, I'd encourage you to try to balance those three as much as possible. But if, if you're new to this, I would pick the one that you feel most natural, most, most naturally gravitate to and go deep there because all three really matter and getting really good at one will significantly impact your business and put you ahead of the founders that think that they can just throw the work over the wall and get fixed prices for things. Uh, so today, just to summarize, we went through the 10X rule of software dev and skateboarding. Uh, next session is all design focused. So we're gonna go through wireframing and what those early stages of getting an idea into wireframes and make that clear for a designer or for yourself if you're doing the design actually look like. Uh, we'll go through different design tools, different design processes, how to get things ready for, for a developer, uh, what not to include in designs. So I'm the lead designer now for, for most of Turtle's products, so I'll be able to share some of those designs. And then we'll have Alex from, uh, from LinkedIn and before that Google joining us uh, so you can hear from a, uh, a real designer about how to best work with them, how to best attract someone like that, uh, because I hope all of you eventually plan to work with people that are at the talent level of someone like Alex. Um, so then week three is gonna be dev focused. So we'll transition what does design look like in dev, and we'll have a couple of devs join us and, and share their perspective uh, on how to best work with them. Week four is management focused. So we'll start transitioning how to push design and dev into the finances behind things. Week five will be all budget focused. So we'll, I'll actually generate some, uh, some spend data from, from a lot of the products that we built at Turtle. Uh, and we'll, we'll just share those sheets that you can use those to kind of see what things took a lot of time, what things took unexpected amounts of time, what things are super quick, and, and some tools in today's environment that you can use to cut costs on, on the parts where it's possible. Uh, week six is gonna be focused on spec development. So as a founder, whether you can design or whether you can wireframe or whether you can use a whiteboard, uh, by the end of these six weeks, you should still be able to make dev ready specs that a developer can pick up and estimate as clearly as possible. Um, and week seven will be that prize competition. So between week six and seven, uh, I encourage you to take what you've learned and uh, especially about how to constrain things to a $5,000 budget and quite literally come up with specs for a $5,000 budget. We're gonna have developers from Turtle uh, decide what is the clearest spec and what they would get most excited about building. Uh, and that will determine the winner of $5,000 in Turtle credit, uh, which will be a little under 100 hours in depth. So it's not, 
you're not gonna be able to build a ton of product, but it's also not nothing. 100 hours of someone's time uh, is pretty significant, and the way that you can break that down with Turtle uh, will, will help you make significant progress with your products. Um, so it's 940, and I wanted to make sure that uh, I left 20 minutes for questions and making sure that we go through all this. Um, so I, uh, yeah, that, that's, that wraps up what I, I wanted to discuss. I wanna make sure that we spend 20 minutes on any questions and, and diving into detail on any parts that are unclear here. Um, and if time allows, we can try going deep into uh, one of your specific products and questions that you might have. Anybody wanna be a brave one to start? I have a really quick question that I think might apply to the group. For any of us that have already started developing, um, when we estimate or when we have a plan for um, our $5,000 of development, should we say like a plan for more things on top of what we already built or a $5,000 summary including things we've built? Uh, that's a great question. I, I would include things that you've built and even future plans because they could get somebody excited about, you know, how does this impact the bigger picture? Um, in the design and development sessions, we're going to dive into a, a little deeper about how to make sure that the work you're doing, like, you shouldn't be working on things that don't matter. And one of the most important aspects of working on things that do matter is the, mo the way that it motivates designers and developers to contribute. Uh, it, it's a natural part of software dev that you're gonna throw things away, especially if the line and wireframing pieces are cheaper than the actual development pieces. Uh, but uh, there should always be a reason for why something is part of a bigger plan. And that bigger plan is what tends to motivate developers and designers and other team members to contribute. Uh, nobody wants to check the boxes and get $5,000 of work done or 100 hours of work done. That's, that's not motivating to any self-respecting professional. Um, they want to be able to put their time in for something that matters and to see how it fits into the bigger picture. So that bigger picture is often framed by what, both what's been done already and what will be done afterwards uh, and what long-term plans look like. Does that help answer your question? Does that answer your question? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, it does. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Um, oh, and before I forget and before we run out of time, um, I wanna make sure that, I thought I had a slide, there we go. Uh, I wanna make sure that we uh, all join OpenLand. Uh, you should have received an, an invite to this before our call. Uh, one second. So OpenLand is, uh, I think a couple of you are on there, or a few of you are already on there. Uh, we started a group chat called Founder Lab. Uh, the system looks a lot like Slack or, uh, or any of those tools. What we really like about it is it started by a YC company. So there's a YC founder in here that's eager to get more early stage founders on the platform and people using this. And he's, uh, I chatted with him and he's totally uh, happy to make himself available for anybody in direct message. His name is Yuri. And he's also in, in this group uh, as well. Um, you should have received an invite link from Brianna in her email that you should be able to join. Um, so if you, uh, uh, if you haven't, please contact us and, and we'll make sure that you get, get in there. But this is what we'll plan to use to make official introductions of what your company is, what it does. Uh, we can have longer discussions about specific pro uh, product issues that you might be facing or, or product ideas that you have and wanna discuss with the rest of the group. Um, we'll also share any kind of schedule updates. Like for example, uh, I know that, that GitLab CEO would not be able to join us at the normal session time. So we're, we're gonna be doing a Friday session uh, with him at the end of August. Um, so scheduling something like that we'll do we'll do in the context of open land um, so yeah please join if you have any trouble joining please contact myself or brianna uh, this is where we'll we'll handle the asynchronous communication between everyone um, cool back to any questions uh, we went through a lot today so i want to make sure that uh, anything that was unclear definitely gets resolved uh, and then anything that you want to dive deeper into uh, we have a chance to do Okay, so uh, like, I'll go to... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, okay, sure. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned that like going from uh, sort of idea to design is like a 10x already. And I'm working together with uh, with a professional developer. So sort of I'm, I'm on the product and supposedly design side and she's a developer. And sort of the, the, the design part in the middle is missing or like, I try to come up with the wireframes and then I also try to sketch them up in Figma, 
but mm -hmm. I always look at my design and it looks like shit. So like my question <laughs> is, you know, like should I invest into a designer or should I rather try to sort of self-learn to produce something that is, you know, okay-ish? What's a good strategy there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the real answer is you should do both. So you should enhance your own skills as a designer, um, enhance, you know, it's hard to train something like taste and, and art. We're not all born with being great artists, but there are some basics and we'll go through this in the design session next week. Um, but like for wireframing, uh, two tricks that I would use are one, uh, recreate something that already exists because when you create something that's new in your own, uh, you're not distracted, but it, it's natural to think about, all the things you could create it's this open-ended thing versus like let's recreate one screen from instagram and let's wireframe this there's a constraint of this already exists and i can visually create what this would look like either to a developer or to a designer and i would start with what this would look like to a designer because i, I do believe that anybody can teach themselves to wireframe or sketch to a point of here is the concept of what i'm building i'm communicating the most important pieces uh you can do that with grayscale so that you don't distract yourself with colors and logos, et cetera. So I would start with a design of somebody else's. So a login screen, even though login screen should not be part of skateboards, just wanna be clear there. But a login screen is an easy one to design just to teach yourself the mechanics of it. So look at Instagram's login screen or Facebook's login screen or Twitter's login screen, any company that has sophisticated design and, and design that you really respect and like and think that they, they've, they've done well. Uh, and wireframe one of those screens and ask yourself, if I was working with a designer, would they be able to take this wireframe and design it into something that looks development ready? Or am I able to take this to development ready? I, I would not, if you're feeling not confident about the designs that you're creating, I would absolutely pause and make sure that you make adjustments to the team now because a developer will not make it look better. Uh, there, there's zero percent chance that you start with a wireframe and then the developer somehow magically turns that into something that looks better than your original designs. Uh, in the case of somebody, a, a company like Instagram, they are working with Figma or Sketch or those tools and creating pixel perfect variants of every little nook and cranny of this uh, before that goes to a developer. So, for example, um, if anybody's worked for a couple of people that are on Turtle and have seen Turtle, you know, for any for our our mobile app system every little pixel and nook and cranny of, of, uh, of the app gets to, I, I design in pixels because, and if you look at the actual product, it looks quite literally like this. It, it won't look any better, it won't look any worse if you're working with a developer that, that you trust to turn pixels into code. Um, yeah, but to summarize that, start with somebody else's designs so that you can learn, learn the mechanics. Once you're feeling confident with the mechanics, then move on to your own designs. Uh, and I, I really encourage you to use grayscale. Uh, so anything between white and black makes it really easy to communicate priority. And when you're wireframing, you're not really communicating design, you're communicating priority because a professional designer can interpret that priority and say, well, you've got these three conflicting things that all look important. And if this is supposed to be the most important thing, we should isolate it like this. Um, so it, wireframing is a design language. It's a communication tool. Uh, and from the purpose of, or for, from the perspective of someone who may not be a professional designer, uh, I would focus on communicating priority. And then that priority can get translated into development ready design, and then somebody else who's creating those development ready designs can then translate that to code. We're gonna go much deeper into this next session, um, and I hope next week all of you are gonna feel confident walking out of it with at least being able to wireframe well. I think anybody can do that, whether you're a professional designer or not. So Stephanie, I know that you had another question there. Yeah, um, so going back to what you were saying about um, cutting out the fat or what you don't immediately need, and you mentioned um, the login or authentication screen as an example. Um, but what if like it's just really easy to integrate something that's already been built into your plans? Um, like would that, that probably wouldn't take much time, it, right? No, it wouldn't. And that isn't to say that you don't build login screens or that you don't have login screen. Um, it's, it's more theoretical than that and, and trying to get you away from distracting yourself from the core essence of what your product should be and focusing on all these other things that are must haves and need to get checked off, but they're as simple as something that needs to get checked off. Um, and if you're thinking about how do I press a button and get a car and what kind of login screens am I using, then 
at least 1% of your energy is now being distracted away from that core nugget that really needs 100% of your energy uh, into something that has already been figured out before. It doesn't require your energy, doesn't require a creative process. Uh, so it, it's, it's more fundamental than that. And I want to be clear that it doesn't mean that you build products without a login screen, but if you, if you embrace this mentality of spend as little as possible to get to the next horizon so that you can make the best decisions, uh, your first version of a product will probably be just between you and your developers or you and your co-founder or a very, very small team. And that small team doesn't need a login screen. It doesn't need authentication. That stuff just doesn't matter for day one. The first Uber app, even though I wasn't there in the room, if it was built correctly, probably skipped all that stuff and was quite literally a screen that said order car and then faked everything behind it. And you probably pressed a button and saw a map and that was it. And until they got there and until they were able to use that in, in their hands and actually click and feel how that product um, actually felt, uh, they were not in the best position to then make the best next decisions. Uh, and that actually could impact uh, login screen. That, you know, we've, I'm a little embarrassed by this, but just to, to give you a sense of, of how we prioritize and how much we embrace this, uh, we've been building Turtle for, for three years now. You can only log in with Google. Uh, that's because we, we didn't want to distract ourselves with different kinds of authentication. So Google lets us, uh, Google takes care of authentication for us. So we know they're real people with real accounts, with real storage. If they change their name or their profile, they can do it inside of Google and we pull that info. It helps us focus on the parts that actually matter, which is task management, chat, video software, people to meet, being able to pay developers, um, all the, the different elements that are necessary for, uh, for part-time work. Uh, we did not feel that a different way to log in was one of them. We have absolutely hit ourselves with somebody doesn't have a Google account and needs to use a personal Google account to log in instead of, uh, instead of their work email. And that is a sacrifice that we're willing to take so that we can focus on what are the core nuggets of our product instead of the parts that, that aren't going to matter as much. Um, so to summarize that, it's, uh, I wouldn't distract yourself with it in the early stages, especially when it's just your founders. And then I would also just use that example of, you know, Turtles gotten by with just Google login. And of course it, it has been annoying and painful, but would we rather spend the energy on, on login or would we rather spend the energy on the parts that, that really matter for our customers once they're in the product? I guess for us, I felt like it was a little bit integral to not, not the login for us, the co-founders, but for the comedians, because yeah. we want them to sign up a, a, to create a profile page and for them to be able to come back and visit and be able to manage their own pages. Absolutely. And there are certain products where the sign up process might be your, your skateboard. So if the most important thing and the most repetitive thing for you to do is to sign up, then, then I kind of got to eat my own words and you know, that does become the skateboard. But unless the most important thing to your product is the way that people sign up, uh, I would not spend energy focusing on it until you and your, and again, with those, even in, in that example, um, your comedians will not sign up before you and your co-founder have been able to sign up to, to at least go through the process. So, um, it's tough. It's tough to nurture that from zero to one. It's easier to cut it out. Uh, and I, I would, even in that case, they'll cut out login because, you know, unless that is the number one thing, um, it's not to say that you don't put it in your product, but in, on, on day one in your very first version in the thing that you're using with your co-founders and nobody else in the world is seeing the thing that you're just using to get to the next horizons that you, you can make the best next decisions. Uh, I, I doubt that that login should be in there. Um, we've got a little uh, over five minutes left. If anybody has like one or two more questions, if not, we can uh, we can cut off early, and you guys can have five six minutes back in your day. I'm curious, uh, what's the last thing um, that you read or you learned that changed your mind about something uh, product wise or building things wise um, that you had believed in for a long time prior? Ooh, that's a that's a great question. Um, Hmm. Oh man, I, uh, I'm gonna have to think about that. I, I, I reread Zero to One recently, uh, Peter Thiel's book. Um, I, I read it a while back, maybe like four or five years ago and it didn't make like a huge impact on me, I don't know why. And then I just reread it recently and all of a sudden it did. Um, and specifically, uh, I, it, this is this is going to sound incredibly stubborn of me, 
Um, but he's very against part-timers and, uh, and outsourcing, et cetera. And I'm building a company around that. So he helped me think about uh, what parts shouldn't be outsourced. Uh, I, I, I don't think everything should be outsourced. And I, I, I've never you know, thought that everything can be out. Like you can't outsource co-founders. But he did force me to look at things from the perspective of a Silicon Valley investor, somebody that's doing this from kind of a, a very high level view um, and to cut out a lot more parts of what really shouldn't be outsourced. Um, and to us, that, that's a critical part of the business is deciding what can and can't be outsourced and really defining the, the, the lines of uh, what you really can't have outsiders do and, and what you can. Um, it's not always a choice. Some early stage companies, you kind of have to outsource more than you want to. Uh, but generally speaking, I use this framework of if it's strategic and long term, don't outsource it. And if it's something that only affects you for maybe a year or two or is not strategic, uh, you absolutely can outsource it. Um, and you know, that's not to say that you should outsource less. I, I actually think that most people, specifically in Silicon Valley in the US, skew towards everything should be done by full timers. Um, but if if one of my missions in the world is to, you know, expose more companies to the idea that you can have more part-timers contributing, you can have more things outsourced. Uh, part of the way in getting there is, is learning the things that you can't outsource. I guess kind of ironically using that same process of elimination with skateboarding, but for our own world of, of what can and can't be outsourced. Um, so Peter Thiel has like a totally different view on it than I do. He thinks nothing should be outsourced and everything should be done in-house. I totally disagree with that. I think the future of teams are X percent core and full-time and Y percent part-time. Um, but defining exactly what can and can't be outsourced is is a moving target even for me. So it, it must be a moving target for many others in the world too. Thank you. Of course. Um, any other questions uh, before we uh, cut off for, uh, for this week? Well, if not, uh, I really appreciate all of you being here and, and you know, we're doing this for the first time, but I, I find it incredibly rewarding and um, I get excited about early stage products and, and people, you know, whether you're learning this for the first time or whether this is reinforcing things you've learned or if it creates something that you disagree with and that turns into a conversation that we have. You know, everybody should take their own path for, for learning this stuff, but I, I just hope that by the end of these six weeks, you're feeling like you can be more in control of budget and planning and, and just how this entire process works and what, you know, products look like and this entire x-ray view into something that probably looks like a black box to, to a lot of people doing this for the first time, but it shouldn't. Um, business people are integral players to software development. Designers are integral players to software development. Founders are integral players to software dev. Um, and, and I hope that, that more of you can, can play deeper roles in, in your product processes uh, instead of just throwing work over the wall. So thank you all for being here for week one. Um, that's uh, that's going to conclude our session. Uh, I'll see you all in open land. Uh, for asynchronous chat, and then I will see you all next week for session two. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Take Thank it. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.